Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Right. Uh, maybe five years ago. Was it five years? It's five years already? No. Okay. I was. Uh, Nikki said to me, uh, Anastasia, you know what? Naomi would like to come and give a talk. But it would be nice to have Naomi to come and talk to students about uh, Abraham Games. And I said, like, really? Does she really want to, to come? Is she going to come if we ask her to? And actually, you see, yes, she passed me her email address. I sent her an email. And this is how I first met uh, Naomi almost five years ago. It is more than five, actually. It's Probably seven more than years, five. maybe. <laughs> yeah. So, I've been. Uh, I've been thrilled from the presentation because I, I knew about Abraham James and I, I, I really I know I knew about his work and what he did for this country, <laughs> especially the Second World War and how this country appreciated him as a designer, as an artist, especially at this time of 1950s where it was very difficult to uh, to trust or to focus on design or art, etc. Anyway, Naomi will tell you more about, about this. So today I ask you to join us. Thank you very much for coming. Pleasure. I hope that you will like the, the, the talk. And uh, yeah. Um, and can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for coming. I gather it's the last day of term, so I'm th really well done for coming. Um, and it being such a nice day and all. Um, so, um, does anyone know of my father's work? Some of it, yeah. Yeah? yeah. How? Actually, through a book of uh, visionaries of graphic designers about two or three years ago. So we Not your book. <laughs> You're Israeli, right? Yeah. Okay. Shalom. <laughs> <laughs> um, w anyone else? No? Well, you're going to hear all about him now. So this is my um, dad. He was a great, great father. He was very strict with his children. And this photograph was taken two years before he died. And he knew he was dying at this point. Um, and he was collecting all his work and he gave his children... I just can't control the lights. So. Ah, good. They don't have to see me. That's great. That photograph of me on the poster is awful, by the way. <laughs> it's not me. Uh, how is the, how, can you see her? No, you, you don't need to see me. You, you see, you've got to see the work, because I'm not the work. That's my dad. So, um, what he was doing for two years before he died was collating all his work, and he made his children three books of all his work. And so with the, with the copy that I got, I was able to write six books about him, six, and I'm about to write another two, and then I'm done. And um, we had a touring exhibition that began at the Design Museum in 2003, and it's been touring ever since. So my father was a, um, hated art colleges and hated art teachers, Sorry, <laughs> he thought they were all rubbish, and um, but he was a fantastic educator. He and um, his he wanted his archive to be um, available for students. So if any of you have to write a thesis or or do or are interested in more work, we have a fantastic archive. You can come to my home. Um, you can get me through abramgames.com. Um, we've just got a new website. I hope you like it. It's taken a long time to do it, but we've got one. Um, and um, you're very welcome to come. I'm in North London, in Kilburn, on the Jubilee Line. And I, a whole group of you can come. And what we have are his working drawings for all his posters that he did after the war. So my father designed um, 100 posters for the war, for the army, and another 200 posters on top of that. So that's 300 posters and symbols and all sorts of things. Um, so he was born in the East End of London. His parents had 
um, escaped um, anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe and they arrived in 1904. His father was a soldier and photographer in the Russian Imperial Army and they came on the ship, they were very poor, they were refugees and they, my grandfather set up a photographic studio in the East End of London and um, he had a studio on the ground floor and the family lived above the shop and Abram slept in the um, attic, which was also the dark room. And as a child, Abram learned to use the tools of the trade. And he used um, this tool. Do you know what this is? He had three of these. One of them's up there. This is another one. Airbrush. That's right, it's an airbrush. And he was fantastically skilled at using this. A lot of designers like Cassandra and um, Paul Collin, Austin Cooper, McKnight Kaufer would use um, the airbrush. It's not Photoshop airbrush, it's a real airbrush and it's a bloody hard thing to use. It, you have to be very dexterous and it's very laborious because you've got to stencil out. Now this was a tool for um, photographers because there was no such thing as black and white photography in the 1930s. Um, so if you wanted a colour photograph, you would airbrush the colour on. You would also use the airbrush to touch things up with. So my father was determined, he went to um, a state school and he left at 15 and he was determined to become the best poster designer in Britain. Posters in the 1930s were the king pin of publicity media. There was no such, there was no television in the home, there was no advertising except in magazines and in the cinema, very few people could afford to go to the cinema then. So if, if you wanted to sell a product, you would have a big poster. And posters in the 1930s were just illustrations with a bit of text on the bottom. But Abram was trying to devise a new kind of poster and he wanted to integrate the text and the message together. So here he's experimenting. And by the way, he was so good at using the airbrush, um, that's a tiny little drawing he did um, with the airbrush, that he always signed his checks with the airbrush. He was a terrible show-off. These are experimental pieces he was doing for his portfolio. He persuaded his parents to send him to St. Martin's School of Art after he left school at 15. And they did, they paid for him to go. And he hated it. He left after two terms. And he, he said, I, I hate art colleges and um, none of my children will ever go to art college. But we did. In the end, we, we, I had to fight very hard to get there. I went to the LCC, LCP. At the time. At the time. London it was called, no, LCP, London College of Printing. It's now LCC. It got swallowed up. Um, so this is one of his first designs, and he's signing his name here, G-E-S, very strange, don't know why, guess. Um, and when I found this poster after he died, I'd never seen it before, and I thought, wow, that's amazing and I took it to the post office and I said look what Abram did can you use it and they said oh god no far too modern 1935 so these again are his rough his his working designs they weren't published none nothing that I've shown you has been published but you can see how he's forming his motto and this would be a motto that he would use for the rest of his life maximum meaning minimum means keep it simple don't put anything in a poster or a design that doesn't need to be there just get straight to the point um, so he hated hand lettering because everything had to be hand lettered there in those days so he wanted text to be as minimal as possible because you had to draw it so it was the 1930s, there was a depression, and um, Abram thought, well, I'd better go and get a job. He was still helping his father in the studio. And he got a job as an airbrush artist 
Um, and the boss kept trying to sack him. And um, it took four years for the boss to sack him. He was, he was um, jumping over four chairs in the studio and the boss came in while he was in mid-flight and said, Games, you're fired. Out. You're a bad influence on everybody. They hated each other, the boss and, and my father, who was very rebellious and very left-wing, and the boss didn't like him at all. Um, so Abram went home to his mother, and she went, Oi, you better apologise. And he said, I will never apologise. From now on, I will be my own master and my own slave, and I will never work for anybody again. And he never did. He worked for the army, because he had to, but he never worked for anybody. He was a sole uh, designer and worked on his own. Um, he, although he left St. Martin's School of Art, he continued to do life drawing classes four nights a week at St. Martin's School of Art, evening classes. This is about LCC, evening classes. And um, he saw a competition for evening classes. A poster was needed, so he designed this poster. Nope, sorry, he, this is the first poster competition he entered. Where there's dirt, there's danger for the Health and Cleanliness Council. He won second prize. He won three pounds, big amount of money then. And um, it was printed because the first prize had a lot of colour in it. And to print colour in those days was very expensive. So they printed his um, poster. And then he, his parents said, nope. Second prize isn't good enough. You've got to win first prize. So he entered another competition and won first prize, 25 guineas. And this poster was, these posters were now published and the public hated this poster. They thought it was too Russian constructivist. It was too revolutionary. And they didn't like it at all. And his boss... Um, Mr. Askew at the commercial art studio where Abram was working said, well done, you've won the competitions. I want the copyright to these posters. And Abram said, nope, you're not getting the copyright. I did this work in my time. Um, I did the work in the evenings and at weekends, not when I was working for you, and then my copyright. And at that point, Abram realized that you, if you're a designer, you have to keep the copyright in your work because one day you never know. I mean, you might earn money from it. So he kept the copyright in his work and we, we actually run his estate through his copyright. So if you can, don't sign anything away. Keep it. Keep your copyright as best you can. He's using two-color printing. Uh, two colours here. He's, he's, he's keeping everything very, very simple. And he likes red and black because they, they sh they're very effective. Anyway, he got the, the sack from hit the commercial art studio and for a year he, sh he, he took his portfolio around. It was very heavy because in those days you didn't just have a USB stick. You had huge sheets of heavy cardboard. And he dragged it around and um, he was sent, nobody understood his work. They thought he was too advanced, too, too, 10 years ahead of the public, they said. And no one would employ him until somebody who was a very influential art director, um, Ashley Havenden, and also a very good designer, said, Go and visit a friend of mine who, run, who is the editor of a magazine called Art and Industry. So Abram went to visit this guy and he looked at his work and he said, well, what I can do for you is I can give you a double page spread in the next issue of Art and Industry. So Abram thought, great, and um, this... A magazine was published with a double page spread saying that here's a young designer um, and here's his work. None of the work had been published that they showed. And Abram bought 70 copies of the magazine. There were no photocopiers in those days. So he, he bought 70 copies and sent the magazine with a handwritten letter saying, please, can you give me some work? 
And he sent these letters to the people that would commission posters. And in those days, um, London Transport commissioned posters, um, the GPO, the Royal General Post Office, and all sorts of um, companies um, commissioned posters. And he waited for the phone to ring. And finally, in 1937, the phone rang, and the great Frank Pick, and there's been a memorial unveiled to him in Piccadilly um, last year, this year. Was it this year? Last year. No, this year. Um, he revolutionised um, London transport. Um, he, he, he got all the designers to design wonderful posters. He got lighting designers, architects, and um, he made a good job of branding London transport. Anyway, Frank Pick, said, I've just seen your double page spread in art and industry and I want you to come and see me. So he said, I think I've got a job for you. And he gave Abram his first commission to design a poster. And Abram always thought it was very funny because of course you never get a train every 90 seconds. You do then, but you didn't now. Um, he's using his airbrush, his beloved airbrushes. Again, I went through all his work. I'd never seen these two posters before after he died. And I thought, bloody hell, they're wonderful. They're great. And I gave them to um, London Transport. And guess what they said? Too modern. 1937, 1936. Too modern. And then the phone rang. It was the phone. There was no email. So the phone rang. And um, he's beginning like a lot of designers, he's beginning to use hands. Hands convey lots of messages. As you know, you can do all sorts of things with hands. Um, so, and he's using his airbrush. His color sense is a bit strange, always a bit strange. I never understood it. But um, he always experimented with colors. He never took um, a, a paint straight out of the tube. He'd always mix it in a broken saucer and play around with it. Um, flat colour here, but hands, another hand here. And this is for a magazine illustrated, the covers. Maximum meaning, minimum means. Doesn't need any text, really. It says everything it needs to say. Keep it simple. Posters came in all different shapes and sizes, and these were huge 48-sheet posters. And... Um, We, we don't actually have... We have copies of it, all Abram's posters, but these were huge and they got lost and we don't have copies of them. But Abram had a tiny little bromide print, black and white bromide print of these um, posters. And so just before he died, he picked up his airbrush and laid the colour on top of this, these tiny little photographs, black and white photographs, so that we could see what the colour looked like. Beautifully done. He was very, very um, skilled. He was a very good technician. He was um, always left-wing and... Um, sorry, this is mic. The mic. Is it all right? Can you, is it on, by the way? Um, the Spanish Civil War happened and he decided that he would um, do this one. So why do I need this one? Uh, this is for the reporter. Oh. <sighs> Sorry, I'm going to have to... to not comfortable. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the Spanish Civil War happened, and um, Abram did these two posters for nothing. They're not attractive posters, but um, he hoped that they would make an impact. By the time he'd been called up into the army in 1940, he'd had 24 posters published, and he went to the desk and said, I'm here to join the army, and they looked at him, and they looked through his file, and they said, oh, you're a poster designer. We want you to draw maps. Abram said, I hate drawing maps. Okay, well, how about becoming a cook? Can't cook. Never cook cook. Okay, what about being a driver? Never could drive, never did drive, can't drive. What about the medical corps? 
can't stand the sight of blood. And it went on like this, and the guy behind the desk said, look, I'm trying to help you. I don't want to send you off to the, be a soldier because you get killed and you're bloody useful to us. You could design us maps, draw maps. And Abram said, look, I'm Jewish, I'm a Londoner, and this is a war I want to fight, so please send me off to the infantry. So they did, and while he was there, Abram was drawing the soldiers, darning their socks, writing home, and the barrack room walls were grey, dull, not grey, they were dark brown, horrible, creosoted walls with tiny little black and white diagrams on them saying, look after your weapons, and no one was taking any notice of these little black and white diagrams. So Abram began to formulate an idea, and he thought what's needed for the soldiers in the barracks would be great posters and, and colourful posters, and they would look at the posters, and they would enjoy them, and it would be like an art gallery. And at the same time, these posters could send messages about looking after themselves and, and all sorts of things. So he wrote all this down, and he entitled this, these two sheets of paper Army Poster Propaganda, and he said what's needed in the army are posters that instruct and, and educate and handed these two sheets of paper to his superiors. And they said, oh, that's very interesting, games, and shelved them. Nothing happened. And then a year later, he was called to the war office in Whitehall, and they said to him, we see that you're a poster designer, you can design a poster for the Royal Armoured Corps. And Abram said, well, I could, but I don't have my equipment. I don't have my airbrushes. I don't have my easels. I don't have my paints. Well, where are they? Well, they're in my parents' home that's been bombed. So they said, OK, we'll go with you and we'll see if we can get them back. So every time something, a house was bombed, it was looted. So Abram went to um, the east end of London and, yes, everything had been stolen from his family home except for the airbrushes and the um, studio equipment. So he, he managed to retrieve the equipment and he always used his tools for the rest of his life. I mean, he hung on to them, he loved them and respected them. And he set up a, a studio in Whitehall in the um, attic and embarked on the first of 100 posters for the army. And it's airbrushed, still using the airbrush. So he's working away and he's designing um, a map a week um, to show the troop movements. He's designing book covers, he's designing um, cap badges. And then there's a knock on the door and this girl says, um, private games, um, I need a poster designing for the ATS, Auxiliary Territorial Services. It was a woman's um, section of the army. The queen belonged to the ATS. And um, no girl wanted to join the ATS because it had a very frumpy, khaki uniform that, d that wasn't sexy. But the, the wrens the, had a wonderful uniform and everybody wanted to join the wrens because it was a very well-fitting uniform. But the ATS uniform was belted and frumpy and nobody wanted to join it. So Abram had a poster to design for the ATS. They wanted to get the girls to join up in the ATS with this new cap. They thought the cap would do the job. So um, he said to this girl, I'm not here to design dance. And my father had a very short fuse. He was very sweet, especially towards the end, but he was always very determined and knew his own mind. And he, he, he lost his temper a lot. And he said, there's a war going on and I'm not here to design bloody dance posters. Get out. L you know, leave me alone. I've got work to do. And as she was leaving, he's, he, he looked at her as she was leaving and thought, in his words, that she was rather a corker. 
that's what he said. And he said, look, okay, come back, I'm sorry, I'll design your dance poster, but you've got to pose for me in this new cap. Is that a deal? And she said, yep, it's a deal. And so she got her dance poster and he got this blonde bombshell and it was out and the girls queued around the block and they loved this poster she was great she was sexy she this is the most successful recruiting poster during the war however there was a conservative mp a woman and she saw this poster and she said our girls should be attracted into the ATS through patriotism and not glamour. And she's far too sexy. She's wearing far too much makeup. This poster must be banned. She took this poster to Parliament. There was a war going on. For five weeks, this poster was debated in Parliament, the merits of this poster. And eventually she was banned. So that was his first poster that was banned. Of course, Abram was furious. However, the cartoonists had a field day and the public loved her and his name was getting known and his work was getting known because it was all in the newspapers. It was a big scandal in the papers. So he went to his superiors and he said, look, I wrote this memo a year ago about army poster propaganda can you find it? Because I really think we should do something about it. So they looked at this double, they found this memo and they looked at it and they read it and they said, mm, okay, we'll give you a free hand to design the kind of posters that you think are necessary for the army. And if this experiment doesn't work after six months, you go back to your unit. Okay? He said, great. So, can you imagine being given a free hand to do whatever you liked when you're in the army? So he embarked on army poster propaganda. Um, the post, he, he would um, do the research, always did the research. He would um, be his own copywriter. He would do all the artwork and do all the hand lettering. It's not so hot, really. And because he was using his airbrush, he managed to get amazing colours. He managed to mix the colours. And he also managed to make the paint go further because there was a war going on and there was um, a rationing of, of metal-based printing inks. But he managed to, to, to um, extend his paints. Um, posters were printed on recycled paper. There was paper rationing. And um, he... He liked the challenge of, of, of his restrictions. He had, he, you know, he, he found it very challenging to, to find a way to make really good posters. Um, and he oversaw the printing of the posters as well. He was very proud of what he was doing, very, really proud of what he did. Um, he was um, asked by MI6 to design a poster for the new radar. And he said, what's radar? It was a secret. Nobody knew what radar was. And they said, well, you just twiddle some knobs. So he twiddled some knobs. More hands here. And he thought, well, this poster needs something else. So anyone take a guess what these stripes are? Son of a photographer. Anyone have a guess what the stripe is in radio location? He had a Venetian blind in his attic studio and he photographed, photogrammed through the Venetian blind and then he used his airbrush. And this one, the soldiers were cleaning their weapons like this and they were talking and sometimes they forgot to unload them. And it was very dangerous and, and they were talking a lot and you know, they weren't concentrating. So he wanted to design a poster showing that you've got to be very careful when you clean your weapon. And he thought it'd be great to photograph down the barrel of a gun. And he didn't know how to do this. No, you know, there wasn't um, computers in those days. So he thought, ah, I'll go back to the origins of photography. And he took he took a, 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 a Lee-Enfield rifle 
and he put a piece of card on top of the um, barrel and put a pinprick in the paper, in the card, and exposed the photographic paper through the barrel. And this is actually the inside of a barrel of a gun. And then he used his airbrush to continue it. So um, Saul Bass, who was a friend of my father's, I, kn I know you all know who Saul Bass is, um, you know, 007 and Saul Bass posters, Abram started it, not, not, not them. These are two posters he did for, um, there was a campaign for the public called um, Dig for Victory, and Abram thought it would be a great idea to, to dig up around the barracks and, and um, grow vegetables. So he designed these two rather beautiful posters um, for the army, not for the civilians, but for the army. Again, more hands here, two colours. Um, he went in to see the soldiers in the barracks and he noticed that they were pulling down these posters, um, these ones with the child in the coffin. And he said, why? Why are, you, why are you tearing down the posters? And they said, because we can't bear to live with them. They, they're just so horrible. They're, they remind us of our, of our sisters and our children and they're just horrible and we don't like them. And Abram was thrilled to bits and he thought, well, they've noticed the posters. They didn't notice the black and white diagrams on the walls, but they've noticed his posters and they had the, an effect. Um, like a lot of designers, he was influenced by the Surrealist. In 1936, he'd gone to the Surrealist exhibition and everybody was designing posters with clouds all over the place. Um, he didn't like using photographs unnecessarily because he thought it'd be better to draw rather than use photographs. But with these posters, when precise identification was important, um, you couldn't make a mistake with a hand grenade. It had to look like a hand grenade. He used a photograph and then stuck it on. He was also influenced by um, a, f um, a German um, collage artist who'd come to Britain called John Hartfield. Look him up. Amazing guy. More hands here. There was um, a an exhibition put on by the War Office in, in Harrods in London to show the public what was going on in the War Office. So um, there were poster designers there called um, Henrian, his friend, and Tom Eckersley, Robin Day. And the posters hung on the walls with drawing pins, not framed. And the exhibition was opened by um, Sir Ernest Bevin, who was the Minister of Labour, and he, he went round the exhibition and he saw this poster and he whipped this poster off the wall, took it straight to Churchill. And Churchill went crazy and he said, this poster must be banned. And the reason this poster was banned was because the child in the slum at the back has rickets, so it's a vitamin deficiency. And... Um, caused by malnutrition, caused by lack of sun. And Churchill said, there's no such thing as rickets in Britain. This poster must be banned and it must be pulped. And it was. Another poster banned and pulped. And Abram, of course, was furious. He thought Churchill... Abram had done his research and he knew that there was um, rickets in Britain. It was known as the English disease. And we still have rickets in Britain. And um, he knew that this was an important poster, and he was absolutely furious with Churchill. By 1942, in 1942, Abram designed a map a week for the Army Bureau of Current Affairs, and that was um, an organisation that uh, Churchill thought was too communist because it was educating the soldiers. And um, they, um, Churchill... Um, stopped, uh, he, he got rid of the Army Bureau of Current Affairs because it was a bad influence on everybody. And um, Abram designed a map a week for them and 
he designed 36 posters in, in one year, in 1936. He, that's one poster nearly every week and a half. That's the only ever official war poster artist. There's never been a, a war poster artist. There's always been war artists, but never a war poster artist, and there hasn't been one since. So he was really proud of that. He was asked to design a poster for the Financial Times, and you can see how he's working here. So he's got a man reading a newspaper, and then eventually he gets rid of that idea, and the man becomes the newspaper, and he calls this the Man Newspaper. And it was a fantastically successful campaign. It ran... that He, he designed eight posters for, for the Financial Times, a bit sexist, really, because it's all about men. But in those days, men were in business and they read the Financial Times. Um, so this little manuspaper gets up to lots of tricks. Um, he taught at the Royal College of Art one day a week. Um, he, as I said, he didn't like uh, art colleges, but he had to earn a living. He had three children. And so one, d one day a week, he went to the Royal College of Art opened all the windows because he said everything, you, you can't work in a hot room, you'll fall asleep, so made sure that it was cold, like his studio. And he gave designers his brief, and he said, I want the work, I want to see your work on the wall next week when I come back next Monday, and if you don't cut the mustard, if you don't reach your deadline, you're out. He was really strict, and he said... I have to treat students like this because the real world is tough and if you don't reach your deadlines and you don't do good enough work, you're never going to make it as a designer and you're wasting your time. So he, he was really tough on them. But they respected him. And um, so he, had a, he entered a competition to design the first BBC ident and... He used, he, with the help of his students at the Royal College of Art, note that he's wearing a tie and, and a suit, unlike your... In those days, tutors had to wear ties and suits, and, and they all smoked. And but amazing how... <laughs> this is a lecturer, right? You have to wear... It. <laughs> um, and um, anyway, with the help of his students, he made this strange Heath Robinson... Thing, and I have a film of it working, I'll show you later. And um, it was the first moving BBC ident. And it was filmed just long enough to harp music for, it, for them. It just worked, and then the whole thing collapsed. It's a strange contraption here, but I'll show it to you working. Um, anyway, there was a dance every week, and my mother... This is the BBC ident, and we'll sh show the film if we have time. And at the Royal College of Art, there was a dance, and my mother went to the, to the dance with my father, and the students came up to her. And his students were David Gentleman. Have you heard of David Gentleman? Len Dayton. Very, very, all, the, all his students did really, really well. Um, and the students came up to my mum and said, we're so pleased, Mrs. Games, that your husband comes and teaches us once a week. And she said, oh, thank you very much. He said, no, you don't understand. If he came more often, we would all leave. They, they respected him, but he was tough. He was a tough nut. Um, 1956, um, Penguin Books had monochrome covers. They had orange covers, green covers for crime, purple covers for travel, blue for art, green for biology. Um, and Sir Alan Lane, the, the, uh, the director of Penguin Books, decided that American publishing was coming to London and they were bringing colour covers. So Penguin should pull its finger out and produce some colour covers. And he got Abram to be the art director of Penguin Books Experiment, which lasted a year. Abram asked his students to to help him design the covers. These are four that Abram did, but together with his students at the Royal College of Art, 
they designed 36 colour covers. And in the end, Sir Alan Lane, who was very English, said, these covers are very crude. I don't like them. The experiment has to stop. And he called them breast sellers. Not best sellers, but breast sellers. He thought them very, very crude. Shame, because they're great. So American advertising agencies was um, bringing, coming into to, to Britain and um, the era of Mad Men, you all know Mad Men, and they were bringing with them colour photography. So posters now were beginning to be colour photographs. And Abram thought, well, I better change my style. And also the methods of printing changed. So instead of lithography, they were posters were being printed by silk screen printing. So he hung up the airbrush and he began to lay flat colour, which actually gave him much more simplicity and he liked it and it became, you know, he was, man he was able to make everything even more simple and bold. And so he designed this poster for Guinness and he said to the people who were sticking up Guinness, doesn't matter which way you hang it, just have some fun. Drink as much Guinness as you like and just have some fun. And you can see he's having fun with his name here. He's um, signing his name, A Games Full Stop. Very important to him because it was his work, nobody else's. And, and he, the full stop on the end of his name was really important to him. So when he was dying, we were, his three children were around the bedside. And I said to him, we drank a lot of whiskey. So did he. <laughs> and I said to him, Daddy, do you want a full stop on your gravestone? And he said, yes. And he's got a full stop on his gravestone, which is very strange for <laughs> a Jewish cemetery. They've allowed him a full stop after his name. And he'd be very pleased with that. And because I was a designer, I had to do the gravestone. Well, actually, he designed him, his and my mother's gravestone because she died before him. And he designed something very beautiful to put in the... It was a double gravestone, and he designed... A, a motive for the for the inside for the middle bit of the gravestone and it's it's quite amazing Paul Rand designed a gravestone I mean a lot of people uh, artists design their own gravestone it's a very interesting book that would make so even the manuspaper had to change style because of silk screen printing and because of the color photographic posters um, because now they stood up. Oh, these would stand out next to the photographic posters because um, the airbrush posters were too delicate, really, to stand up next to the photographic posters. And here's the girl on the beach in a bikini um, for Jersey. They changed style. And here's a series of stamps he designed based on his three posters for Jersey. Beautiful set of stamps. And the BOAC also changed style. <coughs> and it's the swinging 60s, so the colours are changing. And things, his work became even more simple. And I'm going to start being quick here. <coughs> Again, he changed his style, and this is supposed to be a stained glass window for Ireland. And I think the mark of a good artist, someone like Hockney, you change your style, you move with the times. Picasso, Hockney, amazing. Now, this is um, a poster without any text, except it has text because around the clock are the names of his children. <coughs> he, 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 hid the t he hid us in, the, in Big Ben. It's Big Ben. Uh, but how my father got away with this poster, I don't know. So who's the client? I mean, this poster hung. Who's the client? It hung on the hoardings. Who's the client? What, what does it say? Uh, it is the, yeah. <coughs> Who? Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah, London Transport. Look how small that rondelle is. I mean, I, I don't think anyone would get away with that now because it doesn't say anything. Sometimes with London Transport posters, you have a pair poster, so you have a poster and another poster with text 
alongside it. But in this case, it just stood by itself. And it, he got away with it. Amazing. I never got to ask him. I never appreciated. He worked at home, and um, I never kind of appreciated his work because I, I just was so used to it being around, and I was used to him working at home, and I never said, who's the client? I mean, it never occurred to me. And here's another one for TFL. Well, it wasn't TFL there. It's London Transport. They don't do posters like that these days. Um, a poster for car-free, carefree means get rid of cars. I'd love this poster to be reintroduced, but difficult one. Um, so after he died, I went through all the work and I found these little thumbnails of anti-smoking posters. <coughs> and I thought, oh, great. He designed a lot of posters, like a lot of people did, for smoking. And he... He smoked. He was a very heavy smoker. And I found that in the end, he wanted to design anti-smoking posters. And I thought, oh, fantastic. And he designed little thumbnails of a few different anti-smoking posters. And I took them, these thumbnails, to um, the cancer research people and said, look, here you go. Just I'll give these to you, do what you like with them. And they did, and they, they ran a competition for students, and they made a postcard of them, and um, this sums Abram up. This is maximum meaning, minimum means. It doesn't need any text at all. It doesn't need any more color. It says exactly what it needs to say. So um, he, his parents belonged to a synagogue in Muswell Hill, and he was asked to design a stained glass window for the, a Holocaust stained glass window. So he taught himself how to make a stained glass window, but actually it was made of resin, not glass. And he used real barbed wire and um, a, a Star of David and a torn prayer shawl. God wouldn't like that very much. And a hand. And this motif of the hand also became a stamp in the end for Israel. And um, it's a beautiful window that you can still see. And then one day, um, I, he had a, a very cold studio at home. And there was a blue nylonium floor lino. Anyone know what lino is? Anyway, it was a cold floor. And he was on his knees when I came home from school. He was on his knees and he was, had a, a calligraphy pen and he was, had a, a little bottle of ink and he was dipping this, it was a brush, and he was dipping this little brush into the ink and he was on his knees and this sheet of white paper and he was saying like this. And we said to him, because the kids used to come back from school and we always used to say, hello, Daddy, what are you doing? And there he was on the floor going. And um, he's, he's, we said, what are you doing? And he said, I don't know. I don't know. I've got a, a commission to design a panel, a memorial panel for the Holocaust victims, but I don't know what I'm doing. And he said, this hand is just taking over. It's just got a life of its own. So you and then he finished, and then he stepped back, and he started to cry. And we said, what's the matter? He said, well, I've, something happened here. And, and my, his, his hand took over from his brain, and it had written the names of all the ho um, concentration camps. So this is a very moving memorial panel for the victims of the Holocaust here. Um, 1975 he is his last poster for London Transport and it's for the zoo and uh, he's this is how he works and um, on a sheet of layout pad and uh, he's thinking oh well I'll do a, uh, um, a giraffe a cheetah a zebra but in the end he does a tiger and his first granddaughter had just been born, so her name is 
written in the poster, hidden. And um, this poster came, was the nation's favorite poster for London transport. It lost out by 139 votes when they voted last in, in 2014 for their favorite poster. And they made a stamp of it as well. So that's the tiger. Um, and this is um, the old bard, and it shows all Shakespeare's plays. And he, he fitted it all together for Shakespeare's face. And the last bit of the jigsaw he put at the top, all's well that ends well, is right at the top. That's the last piece that to fit it. So he was very pleased with that. He often, uh, in later life, he often lectured to his two colleges all around the country, and he was a great lecturer, and he was always incredibly supportive to students, and they used to visit him, and he was always really, really helpful. And um, they asked him, what are your favorite posters? And he said, they're all my favorite, but if you ask me which ones I want to be remembered by, it's this one from the war, with the talk spiraling out of control. And there's a, um, a self-portrait, airbrush self-portrait of Abram in his uniform there. This one um, for the United Nations um, World Health Organization, Food and Agricultural Organization. Nobody liked this poster because it was far too in your face. It, it said what it meant. And they thought, it's, too, it's just too much. No, um, but they reprinted it a few years ago. And um, 1956, he was asked to go to um, an advertising agency called Benson's, who had a client called Guinness. And Benson, because Guinness... People, an organization like Guinness used to go to an advertising agency to get their work done. So the advertising agents asked Abram to design a poster for Guinness. And before, um, all the posters for Guinness before were designed by a guy called um, John, I've forgotten his name, John, John. The, you know, the, the, the posters with the... T pelicans and the toucans and the wild animals, all the zoo animals and the men holding big girders, strength, Guinness for strength. What's his name, John? It's gone. It's a senior moment here. Um, and um, so they said to Abram, we need a, a new campaign for Guinness. So he said, okay. And he, he went home, couldn't concentrate. And he was his own man. He thought, I'll go, I'll go and I'll um, go to a cricket match. And he marched up the road, jumped on a bus. And he always liked to work on public transport because there was no tele telephones, no children, no guests, no, because he worked at home. So he was always interrupted. And um, John Gilroy, that's it, got it in the end, John Gilroy designed those um, Guinness posters. Anyway, so he, could, he got on the bus, went on top of the bus because he was smoking, of course, and he always had paper in his pocket to work on. He had a biro, but he'd left the house so quickly that he forgot a piece of paper. He looked in his wallet, no paper. Always had paper in his wallet, all folded up so he could scribble. He loved to scribble. Uh, didn't have any paper. So he thought, oh, I've got my bus ticket. So this is a bus ticket. It's the back of a bus ticket. And by the time he got to his cricket match, he had designed his poster. So he took his um, design to Benson's and they went, oh, it's too simple. Oh, this can't, can't show this to Guinness. There's no pelicans and toucans and, and men and it's just too simple so he said too bad if you don't like it go and get another designer and they said but where are the other designs he said nope 
this is what you need. I'm not going to do any more. Show this to Guinness. Six months later, the phone rang and Guinness had decided that they would take a chance on this poster. And it won five international awards, this poster. The poster that was far too simple. It broke all the rules. Um, 2014, my dad, had he been alive, would have been 100. And um, they, they made him one of 10 remarkable Britons. I'm so proud of him because he is the only designer ever to be on a stamp. And he is in good company with remarkable, another ten, nine remarkable Britons, and he would have been very pleased to be in that company. And um, so this is his stamp. And when it was his birthday that year, they made a postmark for him. Anyway, so that's my dad, and he's wearing um, a smock that he always wore that his mother made him. She was a, a seamstress, and she made him smocks so that he could get them dirty and work on them with them. Um, so when he gave lectures, he always ended the lectures with the three C's. And he's always told the students, and I'm going to tell you, that you must remember the three C's. And the, these are the qualities that you need to be a designer. You need courage, courage of your conviction. You must have concentration. And you must have curiosity. And then he would tell them, don't forget the cash and the checks and the copyrights. And that's the end of that. And I will answer questions if we have time. <coughs> um, I always bring these. These are um, rough, yeah. rough designs. You, well, they can pass them around. These are rough his progressive designs for the Festival of Britain. So there are three sheets. You can pass them around. Are there any? You've been very good <laughs> audience. Long suffering. Uh, oh, the films. Do you want to see the films? Yeah. We got time. Okay. Mm. I'll yeah, they're tired. I'll ans answer questions if you haven't. Can we reduce that? <coughs> It's very hard to cram 60 years of his career into 45 I minutes. Oh, no, 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 not that. That's an airbrush. Yeah, I have it over there. So no. um, there's two films, yeah. So, are there any questions while we're doing this? So this is the um, BBC ident, the first moving BBC ident. So the public had only just got television into the home. We never had a television. My father wouldn't allow it. He thought it was a waste of time. We had the radio. Um, so I don't know why it doesn't work proper. No, no, the BBC. So, so when, the, when it was shown in 1953... Um, we went to our grandparents to watch the telev television and um, it's, it had flashing lights. And then the next day, the public was scared stiff and the, and the papers were full of um, people saying, the government's trying to hypnotise us. <laughs> they called it the cockeyed wonder, this thing. And it's not very good quality, is it? Yeah. So this is the roving eye, the cockeyed wonder, the bat wings. And then here is a coffee maker that was shown at the Festival of Britain that my father had to, to teach himself um, product design. He had to learn how to make a three-dimensional product. And it, this coffee maker makes a great cup of coffee. And it was just after the war. You can buy these on eBay. And it makes good coffee because there's no aluminium touching the coffee. It's at just glass. And um, it's made from recycled Spitfires. <laughs> and that was a hell of a film to make. It had to have 
we, we had about 30, I had to make coffee in it 30 times till we got it right. And my God, I was shaking all over <laughs> after that film. Okay, any questions? Must be one question. Not one question. We'd like to say that, in our opinion, it is not suitable for children or for those of you who may have a nervous disposition. <laughs> Where'd you get that for? This is BBC television. So this is like the BBC Live. <laughs> so I just had here the... Um, this is the... The, 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 the airbrush. Yeah. Anastasia, do you know how to use an airbrush? I know, I have, I, I have to use it while I was in, in, in the university. Do you think that you it's would... It's very difficult, it's very difficult. Ask him to show you how to use it. It is very difficult, guys. Sometimes Get him, you have nag to blow, him. Sometimes you have a balloon underneath it, you have to press, sometimes you have to press it. It's two different things, yeah? <laughs> so it's a very difficult thing to use. This is an old model. So even yeah, 1918. Yeah, and even, even worse, like, yeah, I have, I've worked on a new one. I think that next time I'll go to Greece, I'll bring you mine and see how it's Oh, yeah. 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 So it's, it's, it's amazing. Has yours got a bulb? Sometimes they have a big bulb on top. Yes. It has yeah, we've yeah. got another, we've got but one mine, with mine a bulb. Is a thing, it's, it's, it's half plastic, half metal. Oh, no, this it's is a very beauty. Very yeah. But this isn't, this, what it's happens, what happens is that there's a, um, a cable attached to the bottom of it bit and, and it's a long cable and the cable goes into a big canister of air which we still have we have the cables we have the and there's a foot pump and you have to press to the foot pump and then you draw back the the lever and you put the ink in and you have to be you have to mask everything you don't want painted of course and you have to be really really careful with it because yeah, it splatters. My, we had new carpets <coughs> when I was in my first year oh in the university where I had to <sighs> start to make a cover for music CD cover, I can't remember. So I had to create huge, really nice, simple photo, typographic photo, it is difficult. So that was a bit of a disaster. We had to change the carpets in the flat, <gasps> in my room at least, yeah. And my mum, she was like really depressed why I had chosen to do design in the university. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so never use an airbrush. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't have a studio <laughs> space, you know, it's, it's very difficult. But do none of you boys, have you not ever done graffiti? Uh, no, that's, that's the thing. No? With, with, uh, spray. with a spray, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah spray. <laughs> right, Naomi, okay. uh, do you have any questions for Naomi? Yes, Caitlin. <laughs> Um, he was inspired by the three C's again. He liked the three C's. So he was inspired by Cassandra, who's the three Frenchmen. They were three Frenchmen. Cassandra, Paul Collin, and who was the other one? You see, this is what happens when you get old. This is well, it's the end of the day now. Come on. <laughs> no, no. And a third one. And a third one. one. French, no, French. no, and, but Kaufer, that, but Kaufer was American and he begins with a K, so the three C's are not, I, I will, Paul well. Collin, Cassandra, and there's another one which I've forgotten, it, it will come to me, they, it does take a time to, because the older you get, the more stuff you've got, and, it, and it's hard work retrieving it. Um, Great. Um, uh, and he was very, very inspired by Cass Edward McKnight Kaufer. Have you ever seen his work? Edward McKnight Kaufer was the boss. And he was American and he came to work here. He designed a lot of posters for London Transport, Kaufer. And there was also a guy called Austin Cooper, who was also very good. But it was basically Kaufer and Cassandra. And Cassandra did those beautiful ships, airbrush ships, you know. Have a look. Moran, 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 Cassandra. Any questions? Any more questions? I hope guys you enjoyed that. I think you learned quite a few things. Uh, I, I it's the whole yeah. history of graphic design. <laughs> it's the whole history of graphic design. I'm, 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 as a graphic designer, I'm quite like happy to see like graphic designer uh, on a stamp or on a thing. Yeah, yeah. Whenever there won't I be go another to one. places and I see Abraham's work, like, Brixton Station. Oh, yeah. No, no. Not Brixton. Stockwell. 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 Sorry, Stockwell. 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 He did... Does anyone know Stockwell on the Victoria Line? Oh you know right. the tiles? Not 
um, it's the Victoria Line tiles, says uh, there's um, a swan, a geometric swan that he designed. Now, I didn't show that here because I can't show yeah, everything. Can show a it's Stockwell. Yeah. So you will see a triangle comes out. It's very nice. It's all geometric, and it's if you step back from the platform, you'll get killed. But if you step back Good before life. the train <laughs> comes, you'll see it's a swan. But you, you have to step back. Well, so thank you very much. Yeah, um, <laughs> para <calor. laughs>